welcome everyone so today i'll be talking about bone disorders and its treatment so first thing we'll know about what is bone remodeling so throughout our life bone has been continuously remodeled with about 10% of the adult skeleton being replaced each year so what is the basic purpose of this bone remodeling it is to remove and replace the damaged bone and to maintain the calcium homeostasis so there is it basically involves three steps so first thing is bone resorption so this is carried out by the osteoclast cells so these cells are involved in the breakdown of the bone after the bone resorption the osteoblasts or the bone building cells synthesizes new bone so this step is known as the bone synthesis or bone formation next step is known as the bone mineralization during which the crystals of calcium phosphate which is also known as hydroxyapatite are deposited to the new bone matrix during this process so this is simply but uh, the strengthening of the bone so the bone mineralization is simply known as the bone strengthening so last the bone will enter into a resting phase until the cycle of the remodeling begins again So this is the usual re, uh, cycling process. So what happens is that first bone uh, resorption occurs, then bone formation occurs, then bone mineralization, then into the resting phase, and then the cycle continues. So this bone remodeling process occurs throughout our life. And when does the bone loss occur? This occurs when the bone resorption exceeds the bone formation during the remodeling process. So we'll be discussing about the various bone disorders now that is osteoporosis, pegged disease and osteomalacia. So these are the main disorders of the bone. So what is osteoporosis? So it is usually characterized by the progressive loss of the bone mass and the skeletal fragility. So that is osteoporosis. When it comes to pegged disease that is a disorder of the bone remodeling that results in disorganized bone formation and enlarged or mishapen bones So this pegged disease unlike the osteoporosis is usually limited to one or a very few bones and the patients usually experience some kind of bone pain bone deformities or fractures The third one is the osteomalacia It is a softening of the bones that is most often attributed to vitamin D deficiency and this osteomalacia in children is basically referred as rickets. So these are the three disorders of the bone that is osteoporosis, pegged disease and osteomalacia. And the most common among all these three is the osteoporosis. So we will be discussing about the drug therapy of osteoporosis mainly in this video. So we have already discussed about the osteoporosis so that is characterized by the progressive loss of bone mass and skeletal fragility and hence these patients have an increased risk of fractures which can cause a significant morbidity so which are the populations which are more prone to this osteoporosis they are the older men and women but is most pronounced in the postmenopausal women the reason for this is that Estrogen in the women plays a very important role in the health of the bones. This estrogen plays a very important role in promoting the activity of the osteoblast. So we have already discussed what is osteoblast involved in. It is mainly involved in the bone formation. Now what happens in postmenopausal women? So there's a deficiency of estrogen. As a result, the activity of the osteoblast is reduced. At the same time, it causes the proliferation and activation of the osteoclast so we know that osteoclast is responsible for the bone resorption that is the breakdown of the bone so this is one reason why the postmenopausal women are more prone so what are the different uh, risk factors that is making uh, women more prone to osteoporosis that early menopause before age 40 absence of menstruation complete hysterectomy that is the removal of the uterus thin body build up family history of disease lack of exercise smoking excessive alcohol use bone thinning medications such as corticosteroids and the race that is being caucasian or asian the treatment strategies of osteoporosis mainly include both the non pharmacological and the pharmacological treatment so the non pharmacological treatment includes the adequate dietary intake of calcium and vitamin d weight bearing exercise smoking cessation at the same time we have to avoid the drugs that could lead to increase in bone loss 
One such example is glucocorticoids, such as prednisone, of 5 mg per day or more, or equivalent dose, could increase the risk of osteoporosis. So, the other drugs that is responsible for causing increased bone loss includes anticonvulsants, aromatase inhibitors, furosemide, heparin, aluminum antacids, medroxyprogesterone acetate, PPIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, thiazolidin dions, thyroid with excessive replacement. Coming to the pharmacological therapy for osteoporosis, it is warranted in postmenopausal women and men aged 50 years or over who have a previous osteoporotic fracture. A bone mineral density that is 2.5 standard deviations or more below that of a young adult or a low bone mass with a high probability of future fractures. So the first class of drugs we'll be talking about is bisphosphonates which include the alendronate, ebandronate, risodronate and zoledronic acids. So these are agents that is used for the prevention and treatment of postmenopausal osteoporosis. And along with these agents, etidronate, pamidronate and tilidronate play an important role in the treatment of bone disorders such as osteoporosis and pegate disease as well as for the treatment of bone metastasis and hypercalcemia of malignancy. So what is the basic mechanism of action involved is that this bisphosphonates decrease the osteoclastic bone resorption mainly through an increase in osteoclastic apoptosis that is a programmed cell death and inhibition of the cholesterol biosynthetic pathway that is important for the osteoclast function. So the osteoclasts are the bone resorbing cells which are formed from the hematopoietic precursors via the plasma membrane fusion. So now what is the role of the cholesterol in that is? The cholesterol in the membranes of the monocytes is mainly involved in the osteoclast like cell formation via the cellular membrane fusion events. So what happens here? The bisphosphonates will inhibit the cholesterol biosynthetic pathway important for the osteoclast function. So all of this would decrease the osteoclastic bone desorption. As a result, there will be a small increase in the bone mass and a decreased risk of fractures in patients with the osteoporosis. And the beneficial effects of the alendronate persist over several years of the therapy, but the discontinuation will result in the gradual loss of the effect. Now the pharmacokinetics. The oral bisphosphonates such as alendronate, ristronate and ibandronate are dosed on a daily, weekly or monthly basis depending on the drug. Alendronate is usually given on a daily or weekly basis, ibandronate on daily or monthly basis and ristronate on a daily or weekly basis and the oral delayed release tablet of the ristronate is usually given twice monthly or monthly. The absorption of these oral bisphosphonates after the administration is usually poor with less than 1% of do dose being absorbed. There are certain guidelines to be followed during the administration of this oral bisphosphonates to maximize the absorption because certain foot and other medications would significantly interfere with the absorption of the oral bisphosphonates. So the guidelines include Take with 6 to 8 ounces of plain water only. In particular, take ristronate delayed release tablet with at least 4 ounces of plain water. Take at least 30 minutes, 60 minutes for ibandronate before other for drink or medications. In particular, take ristronate delayed release tablet immediately after breakfast. And the last one is to remain upright and do not lie down or recline for at least 30 minutes after taking the medicine. And for ibandronate, we have to remain upright for 60 minutes. These bisphosphonates are being rapidly cleared from the plasma because they are highly bound to the hydroxyapatite in the bone. Once when they get bound to the bone, they are cleared over a period of hours to years. And the main elimination root of these bisphosphonates is mainly via the kidney. Hence, they are avoided in the patients with severe renal impairment. And for those patients who are unable to tolerate the oral bisphosphonates, the alternatives include intravenous, ibandronate and zoledronic acid. So the common adverse effects of these bisphosphonates include diarrhea, abdominal pain and musculoskeletal pain. 
In particular, the allen donate, rice donate, and iban donate are associated with esophagitis and esophageal ulcers. Hence, to minimize this esophageal irritation, the patient should remain upright after taking the oral bisphosphonates. The other adverse effect observed with these patients are osteonecrosis of the jaw. And this is usually associated with higher intravenous doses used for hypercalcemia of malignancy. Next is usually a very uncommon but usually seen with the use of bisphosphonates is the atypical fractures. The risk of atypical fractures may increase with the long-term use of the bisphosphonate therapy. Next one is the etidonate. In particular, is the only one bisphosphonate that would cause osteomalacia following the long-term continuous administration. Next class of drugs is the selective estrogen receptor modulators. So after the menopause, the lower estrogen levels or the deficiency of estrogen will promote the proliferation and activation of the osteoclast. And hence, the bone mass can decline rapidly. So the estrogen replacement is effective for the prevention of the postmenopausal bone loss. Since the estrogen may increase the risk of endometrial cancer when used without a progestin in women with an intact uterus or breast cancer, stroke, venous thromboembolism and coronary events, it is no longer recommended as a primary preventive therapy for osteoporosis. So one of the selective estrogen receptor modulator approved for the prevention and treatment of osteoporosis is raloxifen. So this raloxifen has got an estrogen-like effects on the bone and estrogen antagonistic-like effects on the breast and endometrial tissue. It is an alternative for the postmenopausal osteoporosis in women who are intolerant to bisphosphonates. Raloxifen increases the bone density without increasing the risk of endometrial cancer. In addition, it decreases the risk of invasive breast cancer and also reduces the levels of total and low density lipoprotein cholesterol. The adverse effects of raloxifen includes hot flashes, leg cramps and a risk of venous thromboembolism similar to that of estrogen. So next class we're talking about is calcitonin and it basically acts by reducing the bone resorption and increasing the bone thickness or density. But it is less effective than bisphosphonates. The salmon calcitonin is usually indicated for the treatment of osteoporosis in women who are at least 5 years menopausal. A unique property of this calcitonin is the relief of pain associated with osteoporotic fracture. Because of this unique property, it can be beneficial in patients with a recent vertebral fracture. It is available both in intranasal and parenteral formulation, but the parenteral formulation is rarely used for the treatment. The common adverse effects of the intranasal administration include the rhinitis and other nasal symptoms. And this agent is usually considered to be reserved for patients intolerant of other drugs for osteoporosis because of the potential increased risk of malignancy with this drug. And the resistance is usually developed with this calcitonin in patients having it for a long period of time in the treatment of Peguet disease. Next drug is the denosumab. This is a monoclonal antibody that basically targets a receptor activator of nuclear factor kappa B ligand and thereby inhibit the osteoclast formation and function. This drug has been approved for the treatment of postmenopausal osteoporosis in women at high risk of fracture. This is usually administered subcutaneously every six months. This has been associated with an increased risk of infections, dermatological reactions, hypocalcemia, osteonecrosis of the jaw, and atypical fractures. So in particular, this drug denosumab is reserved for the women at high risk of fractures and those who are intolerant of or unresponsive to other therapies of osteoporosis. Next drug we are talking about is teriparatide. This is the one first approved drug for the osteoporosis that stimulates the bone formation. We have discussed about the other drugs that is responsible for inhibiting the bone resorption, whereas this drug, teriparatide, promotes the bone formation by stimulating the osteoblastic activity. This is a recombinant form of human parathyroid hormone that is administered subcutaneously daily for the treatment of osteoporosis. 
This drug has been associated with increased risk of osteosarcoma in the rats. So similar to the calcitonin and denosumab, this drug teriparatide is also reserved for the patients at high risk of fractures and those who have failed or cannot tolerate other osteoporosis therapies. So we have discussed about the different therapies used for the treatment of osteoporosis such as bisphosphonates, selective estrogen receptor modulators, calcitonin, denosumab and teriparatide. So I hope you have understood clearly about it and if there's any suggestions and comments please do mail in us. Thank you.